Um, I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Matthew Block. He's going to be talking about the immunotherapy uh, for ovarian cancer, separating truth from hype. Welcome, Dr. Block. All right, thank you. Uh, just before we start, I'll give a few brief uh, disclosures. Um, I don't get any money from these companies, but Mayo Clinic uh, does on my behalf for research done. And I will talk about some uh, experimental or clinical trial usage of vaccines of, and of some other immunotherapy drugs. I am intending to make this uh, presentation as free of bias as possible, but if you have any concerns, feel free to talk to me or the organizers uh, about uh, the presentation. Um, so we have all seen, I think, the uh, headlines, the covers of uh, scientific journals, of books, of popular journals, popular magazines, uh, advocacy groups, and, uh, and others where uh, cancer immunotherapy is, is kind of everywhere. However, it can be hard to separate truth from hype. I mean, there are some situations that are pretty easy. I think those of us who look at CT scans and look at this uh, sample uh, that's a section through a liver can see that the uh, tumors on the top are getting smaller uh, over time uh, when we look uh, later at the tumors that are on the bottom. And, and so this is, yes, this is a promising treatment. But then we also see claims like this where uh, they say that uh, they've never failed to cure any patient where, where it, a reasonable uh, chance for treatment is, is available. And, and so sometimes it can be easy to separate uh, fact from fiction, but often it's more difficult. Uh, as such, today I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of the origins, the beginnings of immunology and immunotherapy, and then talk a little bit about how the immune system works, and specifically what we know about the immune system and ovarian cancer. I'll talk a little bit about natural substances that affect immunity, and then I'll talk about a class of drugs called the immune checkpoint inhibitors that have uh, generated quite a bit of uh, both truth and hype, I would say. And then uh, finally, I'll wrap up with a subject that's uh, near to my heart, uh, cancer vaccines. So we get a lot of good things from Greece, and immunology is no exception. Um, and this, this guy that uh, has a, a marble uh, bust, uh, Thucydides, uh, was actually not an immunologist. He wasn't a scientist. He was an historian. Uh, but he gave some of the... Uh, uh, seminal thoughts about uh, immunology uh, in a book that he, or a, a manuscript that he wrote about the wars between various uh, 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 Greek uh, cities and colonies uh, and the unfortunate pestilence that uh, followed in the wake of war all too often. And he, he wrote, yet it was with those who had recovered from the disease that the sick and dying found most compassion. These knew what it was from experience and had now no fear for themselves, for the same man was never attacked twice, never at least fatally. And I would question how someone could get attacked fatally once and then get attacked <laughs> fatally a second time. But, uh, but I think the, the point is that our bodies can remember prior infections and that this memory can reduce the severity of a second infection. So if you survive the first one, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, and a second attack is generally not as severe as the first. This was merely an observation and not something that we could exploit for about 2,000 years. And then um, this is a picture of uh, Edward Jenner and um, Dr. Waroha spoke this morning about, uh, about clinical research, so here is our research subject. I don't see the uh, uh, Institutional Review Board or the consent form or any of those things uh, in this, in this uh, 
figure. They must be in the background. Um, but I'll draw your attention to this, uh, this figure here. That's uh, a milkmaid. And what Jenner uh, observed is that milkmaids tended to be immune or to not get smallpox, at least not fatally. They, uh, they were protected from getting the smallpox. And at the time, the smallpox was a devastating disease in, in Europe and all over the world. Uh, and what Jenner did is he would uh, prick the finger or the hand of a milkmaid, and then he inoculated uh, or pricked the, the skin of that uh, small boy. And in doing so, uh, he learned that he could uh, protect the boy against developing uh, smallpox. Um, the idea, and, and we understand this more in retrospect, was that cowpox was similar enough to smallpox that once one had contracted cowpox, or vaccinia, uh, one was protected against not only further insults with cowpox, but also with the smallpox uh, virus. And so the use of the vaccinia virus led to the term uh, vaccine or vaccinate. And so even really without any understanding of how the immune system works, we, we being the World Health Organization, was able to eradicate one of the most deadly infectious diseases in the history of the world. And this uh, took place, I think, uh, before I was born. Um, and so the excitement came, well, if we did this without even understanding what we were doing, could learning more about the immune system allow us to tackle and take control of cancer? So let's learn a little bit about uh, what we know about the immune system. Immunology really starts with the white blood cells, and there are many different kinds of white blood cells uh, when, you, when you get out the microscope and, and take a look. Um, broadly speaking, immu the immune system can be classified into innate immunity, boy, those words are small, sorry, uh, and the innate immune cells are white blood cells called granulocytes, also known as neutrophils, macrophages, dendritic cells, and these guys uh, that have a cool name, the natural killer cells. The adaptive immune response uh, consists of lymphocytes, namely T and B cells. And what I like to think of as the innate immune response is kind of the body's most rapid response to an infection. It happens the same every time. So if you get infected the first time or the second time or the tenth time, the immune system will respond in the same way and it will respond rapidly, can do a lot of damage, some to you, hopefully more to the pathogen. The adaptive immune response is much slower to get going. However, it uniquely has the ability to remember. And so it's the adaptive immune response, the lymphocytes, that carry with them the ability to prevent a second infection. Uh, both the innate and the adaptive immune response can help in fighting cancer. We'll look a little more closely at some of the cells uh, of the immune response. This kind of scary looking cell uh, is called a neutrophil. And the eyes and the mouth of the uh, neutrophil are really one nucleus. It, it kind of looks like three separate nuclei because there are, uh, they're lobed almost like, almost like a, a wasp or an ant uh, uh, in their uh, structure. Now what looks like acne uh, is really granules filled with toxic enzymes. And what the neutrophil's job is to do is to engulf or eat uh, small pathogens and then to, to dispose of them and kill them. These are, by the way, the cells that are, uh, for whose uh, precursors are most sensitive to most chemotherapies. So a lot of times when we have troubles with the blood counts, it's these guys that are low because their precursors are very sensitive to many types of chemotherapy. The macrophage can kind of be uh, thought of as a big brother uh, to the neutrophil. Macro, big, and phage is eat, so it's a big eater. Um, you can see it uh, uh, alongside of um, this kind of worried looking cell is uh, a, a yeast particle and it should be worried because the macrophage is eating it. Um, <laughs> macrophages, more so than neutrophils, have the ability to direct 
other types of immune cells and tell them what to do. And they all are also subject to the direction of other uh, types of immune cells. So the, the cells of the immune system, uh, more so than many uh, types of cells in the body, really talk to each other and stimulate different kinds of behavior in different uh, types of situations. A dendritic cell is another uh, part of the innate immune system, but really its main job is to talk to the adaptive immune system, is to talk to the, the lymphocytes. So a dendritic cell samples the environment. The reason it's called a dendritic cell, dendrite is, is kind of like trees or branches, and you can, you can kind of see that when it uh, sits on uh, a petri dish or a microscope slide, it, it kind of branches out, and so that gave it its name. Uh, and again, its job is to tell the immune system uh, the adaptive immune system, what's going on. And that brings us to the lymphocyte, uh, the adaptive immune system. Whereas all of the macrophages, all of the neutrophils, all of the dendritic cells in the body are essentially identical to one another from a genetic standpoint, lymphocytes are unique from one another. That means that one macrophage can recognize both the flu and pneumonia, and, and cancer, whereas a different lymphocyte recognizes each of these different entities. And the reason that lymphocytes can do this is because they rearrange their DNA such that their receptors are different from one another. And so they can represent, uh, sorry, they can recognize over 100 trillion different entities. They have, they have many, many different uh, receptors, and each one is specific for one pathogen or one tumor or one entity. These are the cells also that can expand and can live for long times in the body so that they remember uh, exposures to, to uh, prior challenges. I'll speak a little bit more about the lymphocytes. There are two uh, broad types, the B lymphocytes or B cells and the T lymphocytes or T cells. Now T stands for thymus. Thymus is an organ kind of in the top of the chest, bottom of the neck. It's actually near the thyroid. Uh, and that is where uh, T cells grow up and, and learn how to be T cells. B cells, uh, the B stands for an organ called the bursa. Now, just by show of hands, who knows where their bursa is? Okay. Most of you didn't raise your hands. We don't have a bursa. Um, we actually do have bursas that have nothing related to immun immunology, but uh, the bursa is an organ of immunology only in the chicken, uh, and that's where this was identified. B cells actually grow up, so to speak, in the bone marrow, and I guess that works too for B. B cells have a receptor uh, that's on their surface. I've represented it with these little Y uh, characters here, and that receptor can directly recognize what we call an antigen. An antigen is just anything that a lymphocyte will recognize. Uh, and B cells recognize antigens that are outside of other cells. So if there's a protein on the surface of a tumor cell, a B cell can recognize it. B cells recognize free antigens, which means they can, they can recognize that protein by itself. It doesn't have to be connected to any other uh, protein. They can't recognize proteins very well that are inside the tumor. When a B cell gets activated, what it does is it makes that receptor as a secretable or soluble form, and it spits it out into the bloodstream and into the tissues, and when the B cell receptor is secreted, it's called an antibody. These antibodies can then go and attack their target. Antibodies are one of the primary ways that we become uh, immune to pathogens with uh, with vaccines such as the flu shot uh, or the pneumococcal vaccine. Uh, and antibodies are very good at controlling tiny pathogens like bacteria and viruses. T cells are a little different from B cells. Their receptors are shaped a little differently. And that's because they do things a little different. Uh, T cells will recognize antigen fragments that are from proteins that were made inside the cell. So if the purple protein uh, is the target, the T cell can still recognize it even though it's hiding within the cell. And, and that's because all of the proteins that are made inside of our cells 
will get eventually broken down into fragments, and those fragments will be presented on the surface of the cell by a molecule called the HLA, or MHC molecule. And so T cells don't recognize free antigens, they only recognize bits of antigens, or bits of protein, in the context of these HLA molecules. When a T cell gets activated, it does not secrete a whole bunch of uh, its receptor uh, into the blood, but it instead clones itself. It makes an army out of itself, and so if there's one T cell that recognizes a tumor or a pathogen, it will then make 10,000 T cells that recognize that same tumor, and some of those T cells will go and attack the tumor. Others will form what's called a memory pool that can be long living and can last in the body even for years or decades. Um, the interaction between the T cell receptor and the uh, antigen is one that uh, uh, I spent uh, a PhD worth of time studying, and uh, uh, so I thought I'd, I'd show that just in a slide. Um, <laughs> Uh, so here, if you can imagine, a tumor cell is below the screen, and a T cell is above the screen, and the tumor cell has that uh, kind of yellow and orange uh, molecule. That's the HLA or MHC molecule down here. This is binding to a fragment of a protein called a peptide, and this blue and uh, purple protein here is the T cell receptor, and the T cell receptor can recognize the peptide in the context of the HLA molecule. Different receptors will recognize different proteins, and the reason is that these, this portion of the T cell receptor is what varies from one T cell to the other. And again, there's over 100 trillion different possible combinations. Uh, and so a large array of specificity for different peptides and for different HLA molecules. One of the interesting and sometimes for an immunotherapist, frustrating aspects of T cells is that they recognize different HLA molecules, different MHC molecules, whereas the vast majority of the proteins in our body are identical from one person to another. My hemoglobin is almost certainly exactly the same as your hemoglobin. My albumin is probably the same as your albumin. And if, there's, if they're not the same, there's probably something wrong with one of us. HLA, or MHC, on the other hand, very likely we are all different from one another. There are hundreds of different alleles or different flavors of HLA in the human family, and this diversity is, um, it, number one, makes it easier for us as a population to resist uh, infectious organisms, but on the other hand, it makes it challenging for us to study and treat patients because even if two people are attacked by the same pathogen or the same tumor and the protein that, that uh, we want to respond against is the same, we're going to respond differently because we have different HLA or different MHC. So let's talk a little bit about the immune system in ovarian cancer. About 15 years ago, uh, a guy by the name of George Kukos uh, at, uh, at Penn uh, asked the question, does a patient's own natural immune response to ovarian cancer make a difference? Does it matter? And the, the way that he represented his findings is through what's called a Kaplan-Meier curve. These are, are commonly used by oncologists, but it may not be intuitive to patients. So on the uh, x-axis here, the horizontal axis is time, and on the y-axis is whether an event happened or not. In this case, somewhat soberingly, the, the event is death. So at the top here, all of the patients are, at, are alive. Death hasn't occurred in anybody. And if we get to the bottom, death has occurred in everybody. Um, what we can see is that over time, we see patients that have no immune response, and this uh, immune response was measured uh, by taking uh, a pathologic specimen uh, from a uh, tumor at the time of diagnosis and debulking surgery and looking for lymphocytes, looking for T cells in that tumor. And if a patient had none, their likelihood of uh, survival was lower than if they had at least some. And we can see that most, if not all, of the long-term survivors who are alive out 10 years 
have some sort of an endogenous or natural immune response against the tumor. Now, these data have been repeated in multiple other studies, and they're not quite this black and white. Um, but here is a more recent uh, manuscript uh, from, uh, from last year uh, that was done uh, at the Mayo Clinic. And what we did was we looked specifically at high-grade serous cancer, the most common type of ovarian cancer. And there's kind of a dose-response curve where no T cells are worse than a few T cells are worse than a lot of T cells. Um, and again, we see that a patient's own natural immune response it can somewhat predict the possibility of her being a long-term survivor who remains in remission from her cancer. However, not every T cell is a good T cell. Um, as I mentioned, the immune system can do a lot of things in different contexts, and sometimes the role of the immune system or the job of the immune system is to actually shut down an immune response. This is actually a good thing, if it didn't happen, we would all attack our own bodies because we have white blood cells in us that can attack our own bodies. And that's what happens in some diseases like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. The cells that prevent us from attacking our own bodies in those diseases are called regulatory T cells. And those cells can be identified by co-expression of different proteins. That means they have different proteins either on their surface or inside them. And if a cell has, apparently with a light microscope, red and green make yellow. So we can see that these yellow cells with blue in the middle uh, can be present in tumors. And when they are present, it's actually a bad thing. The more you have, the worse off. And the fewer you have, the more likely things are to go well for you. And so we've got the immune system doing very good things for ovarian cancer, but also there can be a suppressive element where these cells that are good to prevent lupus may not be so good in the context of ovarian cancer. And so the real challenges that I as a tumor immunologist face are number one, how can we expand those T cells that recognize and fight ovarian tumors so that everybody can be in the red group that, that, uh, that has a chance at long-term sur survival? And then how can we stop the immunosuppression that we often see in ovarian cancer? So there are different categories of drugs, if you will, that can play a role in uh, supporting the immune system, making it work better, or preventing the immunosuppression. Um, very popular, and as was discussed this morning, there are natural substances that actually have immune-boosting properties and have been uh, marketed as being very helpful uh, against cancer. Uh, we all know about uh, ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Uh, uh, turmeric or, or curcumin uh, is another one that uh, is, is all over the place in the press. Mistletoe has been touted, and everybody uh, seems to ask me about this one. Um, I, I don't have time to talk about everything, and there are, there are scores more, as you know. Uh, but I thought I would use vitamin C or ascorbic acid as an example because a little more is known about that than some of the others. Um, as it turns out, I had initially had a lot of skepticism towards uh, ascorbic acid in general and just, well, this is, how can it do anything? But as it turns out, there is actually very good science that has demonstrated many of these natural substances, including ascorbic acid, as having beneficial properties uh, as it turns out, if uh, ascorbic acid will enhance T cell development in the thymus, and there are, there are good peer-reviewed papers that, uh, that clearly demonstrate this, they can make for favorable differentiation of T cells so that they make the attacking kind and not the suppressing kind. It can augment or increase T cell activation. Uh, there's a chemical called IL-15 that ascorbic acid increases, and that helps T cells. And it can increase the ability of uh, those natural killer cells that I briefly mentioned to proliferate, and those are good tumor fighters as well. And so with this, there was an incredible amount of hope, and, and it, it helped ascorbic acid's cause that uh, an incredibly influential person, Linus Pauling, uh, two-time Nobel laureate, uh, 
was a big proponent of the use of ascorbic acid. Um, and then a somewhat uh, irreverent uh, young uh, medical oncologist named Ed Cragen, who uh, happens to work at Mayo Clinic, um, decided, well, that's all fine and good, but does it really work? Does it really help patients? And so Dr. Cragen conducted a clinical trial, and he gave some patients ascorbic acid, some patients received a placebo, and then he compared how long did they survive with their cancer? And the answer was it did not make any difference whatsoever. Which I think to, to me would be puzzling because we saw all of these good things that are true that ascorbic acid does, and yet it doesn't help. Um, and to date, this was uh, 1979 when I was uh, a preschooler, um, <laughs> that this happened. And to date, we don't have any studies clearly demonstrating that ascorbic acid helps patients. Um, I am not saying don't use ascorbic acid, don't use vitamin C. I think that there may be a way to translate that benefit into benefit to patients, but we haven't found it yet. Um, I think one lesson learned is that laboratory data does not equal patient benefit. We can learn a lot in a Petri dish, or even in an avatar, even in a mouse, but clinical research is kind of where the rubber meets the road. Whether, whether it helps patients is kind of what we should use to define whether a therapy is useful. I would encourage you, and I think doc, Dr. Kumar mentioned this earlier, but I, I would encourage you to have a healthy degree of skepticism regarding the claims of substances that are not regulated. I'm not saying don't use them, don't take them, but be a little bit careful, especially when somebody asks you to spend your fortune, uh, that find out what science is backing, what backing them, and specifically what science in patients in clinical trials. I would also remind you, and again, uh, I didn't know Dr. Kumar was gonna say this, but I, I agree with her on this and many things. Tell your doctor what you're taking. These substances can influence drug metabolism. They can influence uh, other things. And so most natural products are pretty safe. But I, I as a clinician, would want to know if my patient were, were taking something, just so that I'd be aware. Um, just a brief trip back to the vitamin C story. As it turns out, Mayo Clinic is kind of coming full circle with, with the sorbic acid. We, we were part of uh, the, what kind of took it down as a cancer therapy, but there, there's actually active research at Mayo now as whether a different formulation of vitamin C might be able to get the doses uh, uh, of vitamin C in the system that, that can cause it to have benefit. So I'm not here saying poo-poo on vitamin C. It, it may actually do good things. Uh, it's just that we, ha we haven't figured out a way to give it that makes it do those good things for cancer patients. Um, most of the hype and most of the true benefit in immunotherapy for cancer uh, in recent years has come through a, a class of drugs called the immune checkpoint inhibitors. And there are several immune checkpoints, several immune checkpoint inhibitors. For sake of time, I'm gonna highlight one, and that is the access between two proteins one called PD-1, this kind of bluish uh, guy, and one called PD-L1. PD-L1 is found on tumor cells. PD-1 is found on T cells. You can see PD-L1 uh, staining this uh, tumor. The brown is, the, is an immunostain uh, recognizing PD-L1. Uh, and you can see two people. So this is Li Ping Chen and this is Haidong Dong. Uh, and back in uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, they were cloning or identifying this protein here, this yellow guy, PDL1, and they found that it is expressed by a lot of tumors, that it suppresses the immune system, and that by blocking the interaction between PDL1 and PD1, that there could be benefit uh, to, to patients. 
And I was in the lab next door. This was at Mayo Clinic that this took place. And I had no clue that this was happening and that it was so uh, important. Let's look just a little bit more about the, the, the mechanism by which these drugs work. Again, many, many PhD theses are written on this. I'm necessarily oversimplifying it some. I'm happy to, to yak about this for hours. So if, if you want to ask me later offline, we can, we can chat more. But a simplified view uh, of, these, uh, of these drugs is, as I've mentioned, the tumor cells, like all cells in the body, will present little red peptides, they're not usually red, on their surface in the context of these HLA molecules. If a T cell comes along whose T cell receptor recognizes the peptide and the HLA, that T cell can then become activated, represented by the lightning bolt. However, the tumor cell is not only expressing HLA and peptide, it's also expressing Dr. Dr. Dong and Dr. Uh, Chen's molecule, PDL1. And T cells, once they become activated, can express this green guy, PD1, and the PDL1 will bind to the PD1. That then generates a stop signal that tells the T cell, don't attack, instead, go kill yourself. And so the T cell <laughs> dies or at a minimum, goes away from the cancer. And in this way, the body protects itself against too much damage to organs, protects itself against lupus and arthritis, but it aborts or abrogates uh, what might otherwise be a promising immune attack on a tumor cell. The PD-1 drugs are actually antibodies, so that's why they're represented as a Y, just like those guys that the B cell makes. And these drugs can bind to the green molecule, the PD-1 molecule, and they prevent the uh, orange molecule from interacting and sending that stop sign signal in. And so that allows, oops, that allows the T cell to come in and kill the tumor. Now, I'll admit it took about an hour for me to make that little bomb. <laughs> So again, just like the natural products, we have great uh, promise in terms of what's happened in the lab and what's happened in the animals. Um, but what happens in patients? This is a different kind of plot than the one I showed you before. And this uh, looks at effectiveness of treatment in another way. So this line, line here uh, just represents different patients. So each of these vertical lines is a patient. And when the lines go up, that means the cancer's growing. When the lines go down, that means the cancer's shrinking. And you can kind of get a rough estimate of who is helped by a treatment by looking after the treatment, who's, how many tumors grow and how many shrink. And so there are some tumors, and this uh, example that I show is from uh, another tumor that I treat, melanoma, where a fair number of patients are having shrinkage of their cancer uh, with this treatment, and that's fantastic. We've also studied these treatments in the context of ovarian cancer. And this was, the, I believe, the first study published, uh, and it showed 20 patients, each patient represented by a line, and four of those 20, or 20% 20, uh, 20 had shrinkage of cancer, whereas the other 16 had growth of cancer. So we, yes, we see benefit, it is much less frequent in ovarian cancer than it is in other tumor types. However, um, this plot, and, and Dr. Roja showed uh, a plot like this in the, in the avatars, but uh, this uh, spider plot um, kind of shows can, uh, tumor size over time. And we can see that in those four patients who, who derived benefit, who had shrinkage of their cancer, they, the cancer stayed shrunk for, for quite a while. Uh, and so we rarely see or infrequently see benefit from these drugs in ovarian cancer patients. But when we do see benefit, it can be pretty meaningful. So these drugs are not approved by the FDA for ovarian cancer because they have not worked frequently enough. But we are 
still very interested in actively researching them. So there are a number of clinical trials that are ongoing now and that are coming, uh, testing different PD-1 or PD-L1 uh, inhibitors uh, in the context of ovarian cancer. There are several key questions that we're trying to ask uh, and answer at present uh, that I don't today know the answer to, but I hope to uh, in the near future. One is, can we identify which patients will benefit from immune checkpoint inhibitors before we start treatment? So Dr. Varner Hendrickson uh, talked a little bit about uh, BRCA mutations and how patients with BRCA mutations have a high chance of benefiting from PARP inhibitors. We don't have a test that is that good that applies and is uh, appropriate for most ovarian cancer patients that will tell them, yes, you'll benefit from this treatment. It's worth giving to you, whereas another patient we maybe should say no conventional chemotherapy or a targeted therapy, a PARP inhibitor, would be better than a PD-1 or other immune checkpoint inhibitor in that patient. So we don't have that test, and we are actively seeking it. The second question is, can we help more patients? Can we see more frequent tumor shrinkage if we don't use the immune checkpoint inhibitor by itself, but rather combine it with other drugs? And if if other drugs, well, which ones? And there are a number of preclinical studies that are going on at Mayo trying to sort out what drugs combine well with these, what can, what can really move the bar in terms of increasing the number of patients who respond. Finally, when in the course of ovarian cancer is the best time to use a checkpoint inhibitor? Dr. Waroha talked earlier today about different time points for clinical trials, and we are testing checkpoint inhibitors at various time points to see. Are there cer certain times in the course of the disease where we might see a 50% response rather than a 20% response rate? The last topic I'll try to address is vaccines. Again, vaccines are kind of the original uh, immunotherapy that uh, have shown uh, a tremendous amount of potency in wiping out infectious diseases but haven't yet uh, made a uh, clear case for themselves as a cancer therapy. There are some vaccines that can uh, help with cancer prevention, uh, namely for prevention of uh, cervical cancer and head and neck cancers, but uh, we don't see uh, a lot of vaccines uh, that once a cancer has been established can make the cancer go away or stay away, and that's what we're, we're trying to, to develop. One of the things that is promising about vaccines is it's kind of a numbers game. We can expand the number of T cells or B cells that recognize a cancer. This is a, an experiment called an Ellie spot uh, in which we take blood from a patient before and after uh, vaccine treatment and we try and figure out how many T cells uh, are recognizing the target, the, the antigen of interest. And you can see a couple of blue spots on the, on the plate on the left, but you can see a ton of blue spots on the plate on the right that shows that the vaccine has expanded or increased uh, the number of T cells that see the, the, in this case, cancer. The other thing that vaccines can do is they can reset the balance. So as I said, there's a tendency in ovarian cancer for an immunosuppressive response. So there's T cells, they recognize the tumor, but they do the wrong thing. And uh, in this uh, cartoon, they're called Th2 uh, cells, and we want Th1 cells, and sometimes giving a vaccine can make the, the Th1 cells have more influence, and we think that that can better uh, eradicate uh, the cancer. So what are the ingredients of a vaccine? So here uh, is a uh, flu vaccine. All of us who work in healthcare get this uh, every year, uh, and the flu vaccine is really the active in ingredient, if you will, is dead flu virus. Um, but there are different components to that virus that activate different parts of the immune system. The antigens or the, uh, the protein targets for the lymphocytes are the proteins of the virus. Hemagglutinin and neuraminidase are the, are the main proteins in the flu that stimulate uh, T cells. And so those are a component of the virus. But equally important, we try to, with a vaccine, engage the innate immune system, the macrophages and the dendritic cells specifically, and as it turns out, the flu naturally contains an immune adjuvant, a, a stimulant,
for the macrophages and the dendritic cells in the RNA from the viral genome. And so a vaccine needs to comprise, be comprised of not only antigens, but adjuvants. So the next question is, when should we try a vaccine? So in patients with ova advanced ovarian cancer, we start with a fair amount of tumor, and tumor here is represented uh, kind of figuratively by the uh, protein CA125, uh, which I think uh, everyone and most of the folks in the room are familiar with. Um, during the course of surgery and initial chemotherapy, the CA125 usually uh, goes down and often will achieve a remission. Sometimes that remission lasts forever, and we would consider a patient whose remission lasts forever to be cured. But sometimes, uh, and oftener than we'd like, we eventually see recurrence. Right now, the standard of care after finishing chemotherapy is observation. There are, uh, however, uh, several trials uh, testing different kinds of therapy in that observation window. There are trials testing PARP inhibitors in the observation. There are also trials testing vaccines. I think there are two good reasons to consider a clinical trial in this window when a patient's in remission uh, after their initial treatment. One is that there are no therapies of known benefit, so we're not really competing or taking away opportunities to get something that we know helps a patient. And number two, the, the tumor's kind of wimpy then. We know that in many patients there are still cancer cells, even though we can't detect them. But there's not a robust tumor environment, and so we think that immunosuppression is at a minimum. So most of the vaccines that we've tested at Mayo Clinic are in this uh, setting. We are going to be uh, hopefully testing a vaccine in this setting where a patient's just recently started to have the CA125 climb. That trial is uh, not yet open, but we're working on it. Next question is, what should we vaccinate against? What's the target? And different groups, different investigators have come up with different strategies. So uh, this is from the uh, University of Pennsylvania's uh, public website. Uh, they have an active ovarian cancer vaccine program, and they have adopted the strategy of taking tumor cells themselves out of a patient at the time of debulking surgery, grinding them up, and then mixing them with the detergent to kill all the cells and, and destroy the cell membranes, and then those dead remains of cancer cells become the vaccine. In this way, every protein that's part of the tumor is part of the vaccine. There can be advantages to that. There can also be some disadvantages. Our strategy at Mayo Clinic has been to focus on one protein. And Dr. Waroha alluded to uh, clinical trials. We've had a number of clinical trials and have some ongoing studies testing a, uh, a vaccine that targets a protein called the folate receptor alpha. We like this protein because it's expressed by the tumor, but it's not expressed by many cells in the rest of the body. And so if we get a good, strong immune uh, attack, uh, that attack should not cause lupus or arthritis, and it has not to date. The next question we try to ask is what is the best adjuvant and that's also an unknown. There are several things that we've tried. One is we've combined these bits of protein, these peptides, with a chemical called uh, uh, sargramostim or leukine. This is very similar to if, if uh, people are familiar with Nulasta or Nupagen. Uh, the, the drug is somewhat similar to that. It's a growth factor for white blood cells, but it's also a recruiter for white blood cells. And so if we give a shot and we have the, the leukine present, in the, in the shot, that will recruit white blood cells there that are needed to pick up and process the peptides and talk to the lymphocytes and get the immune system rolling. A second strategy that we've tried is to take white blood cells out of patients via a process called apheresis, think very big blood draw. Um, those white blood cells can then be manipulated in the laboratory the peptides can be added instead of giving them directly to the patient, we give them into the white blood cells. We turn those white blood cells into dendritic cells, and then we give a dendritic cell vaccine to the patients. And we've, we've employed both of those strategies. So the big question is, do vaccines work? And there are several ways to answer that question. 
our first answer in the lab, immunologically, do we see expansion of T cells? And I think the answer is yes, we usually do. Here, on the y-axis, the up and down axis, we see the number of T cells that recognize the folate receptor alpha protein. And we can see that before treatment, there aren't very many. And after treatment, there are a range, but many patients have an increase. And um, if we look at more than one time point after treatment, the vast majority of patients have an increase at some point. We then, though, need to ask the more important question, and that is clinically, does this vaccine help patients? And the way we try to ask that is, can we prevent recurrence? So here, on the y-axis, the event that is either happening or not isn't death, it's recurrence of cancer. And we can see that at the beginning of the trial, nobody had recurred, all the patients are in remission. By the end of the trial, some patients have recurred, but some have not. However, with a small trial, like a phase one trial like this was, it's not 100% clear if those patients didn't recur because the vaccine prevented the recurrence or because we picked patients who were not going to recur anyways. And, and one of the challenges is that we often can't get an answer as to whether a treatment is effective with just a phase one trial. And so this approach is now being taken uh, into several phase two clinical trials, one of which Dr. Waroha already alluded to. I didn't realize he was going to do this, so I apologize if I'm being a little repetitious. Uh, but we are currently conducting a trial. Um, this is a trial that is being run by a, a company, uh, but it's based on the Mayo Clinic phase one trial in which we are taking patients who have had standard surgery and chemotherapy for an advanced ovarian cancer, They've responded to the treatment, and then they're in that period where we would otherwise be observing them. In this setting is one of the few settings where it's ethical to do nothing, because that's our standard, to do nothing. And so we randomize patients, flip of a coin, half of the patients get the vaccine, half of them get a fake vaccine. The vaccine is given once every month for six doses. And then we treat patients quarterly after that for a couple of years. And quarterly is about how often we, we tend to see patients in follow-up anyways. So this, this trial is active now. We're actually developing other trials that are somewhat similar that test the, uh, the dendritic cell approach. Those are not uh, at present available. So just to summarize, patients' immune systems will at least sometimes fight ovarian cancer even without us doing anything. And that can have meaningful benefit to patients. We know that many natural products do alter and affect the immune system. However, in the vast majority of cases, we don't know whether those effects will lead to improved cancer control. Immune checkpoint inhibitors work, sadly, infrequently in ovarian cancer. But in those patients who benefit, that can be, sometimes be very lasting. Uh, and we're actively trying to learn more about how to make that a more effective uh, treatment for ovarian cancer. And then finally, vaccines can lead to expanded immune responses, uh, and we're hoping, but not yet certain, that this will lead to improved outcomes. <laughs>